Greetings, everyone. Uh, at the uh, monthly of the, uh, the April meeting of the insurance uh, committee, um, with the call to order, uh, the next agenda is public comments. Is there anyone from the public who is uh, on the phone or otherwise listening to this or watching this meeting? And the answer is no. So we'll move on. The next is the approval of the minutes of the March 18th meeting. I assume everyone has had a chance to look at them. Are there any comments or corrections? If not, I'll ask for a motion to accept the meeting. Motion to accept. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Approved. Okay. And now we're on to the reports. So, um, Chris Monroe, I think you have the floor. Sure. Oh, um, actually, uh, certainly jump in when you need to. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, everybody. Two things. Um, one that I'm just going to um, provide some commentary on is the uh, monthly claim liability report. Um, that was in the packet that Mike distributed, but I really want to spend time on the marketing um, information and kind of where we're at on that. Um, you know, the song remains the same on the uh, year to date uh, claim liability overview. Um, we're having a great year. Um, you know, any which way you look at it, um, we're in a very positive position when it comes to actual expenditures relative to budget. Um, it's comfortable now to make that statement knowing that we have nine months under our belt. Um, granted, don't want to prejudge, uh, you know, April, May, June, but um, we will end the year in a real strong position when it comes to uh, what we budgeted versus what actually came through. Um, when I look at that surplus, um, to me, that is an opportunity to replenish the coffers, um, to make sure that we're building back up uh, the right reserves that we need um, for our health and welfare plan. So, uh, you know, all systems go when it comes to that monthly report, all right? Any questions for me um, before I move on into the marketing piece? No, we're good. Right. Um, uh, this could, could I ask, Chris, could you um, share your screen on this so we can? I will definitely okay. do that. So let me throw. Then we can actually read it, Paul. See? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was kind of hoping for that. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's the wrong screen. Uh, no, you see it. Do you see it up there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fixed cost um, overview. Yeah. That's it. So Thanks. a few comments before I start uh, diving into it. Um, this exercise, you can argue, goes back to January of 2020. Um, at that point in time, we were more focused on the pharmacy carve out approach. Um, for a variety of reasons, um, we were not able to launch that. But what it ultimately did is it reinforced the need to just keep the RFP moving forward. So although we weren't able to launch the pharmacy carve out for July of 2020, um, through the summer, into the fall, we kept the dialogue going with the various carriers and asked them to resubmit uh, proposals based upon the ability to not only continue with the carve out initiative, but also look at potential alternatives to Blue Cross from a medical administrative standpoint. Um, we have struggled in our relationship with Blue Cross uh, over the last couple of months. Um, they have made some changes in terms of claim and eligibility systems, changing some of their vendor relationships, and it really has come back in a negative way uh, on the town and the board side when it comes to the day-to-day -day administration of the plan. Um, I don't think there's a day that goes by where there's not a call, a place to either the town or board relative to some of the customer service challenges under Blue Cross. So that's a little bit of the backdrop to kind of how we get to where we are today. Um, I have made a recommendation to the town and board. Um, that recommendation has been embraced to a point where we had a series of town hall meetings where we invited in all of 
the various bargaining groups. And in those meetings, we shared this information and we shared our desire to move forward with an approach that is based upon replacing Blue Cross with Cigna Healthcare as our administrator for the medical plan. On the pharmacy side, we would replace Blue Cross and replace them with Express Scripts. So we've put that proposal forward. Um, we've received a request for information from the various unions. We've given them that information and we feel we have a very compelling case when it comes to moving forward. Um, what's driving that decision is information that we're gonna review shortly in the form of the spreadsheet and what the potential financial outcome is. But beyond that, we've done a lot of work to make sure there's no disruption in what they call a network change. Um, moving from Anthem to Cigna, is that disruptive in terms of people and the access to the providers that they're using today and who they'd be expected to use under the Cigna network? Um, the answer is no. 98% um, of all of the providers that our people are using today are also part of the Cigna network. The only uh, small gap that we had from a provider standpoint is we found that there was about 20 or so mental health providers that were not part of the Cigna network. Um, Cigna agreed to treat those providers from a claim reimbursement standpoint as if they were part of the Cigna network. So That's we're providing a uh, safety measure to make sure that employees are not disenfranchised. Although these providers are not part of the Cigna network, uh, members can still see them and have their claims adjudicated as if they are part of the network. And Cigna has agreed to try to recruit these providers into the network. And Cigna's also said, if we get to the end of the first year and we find that we still haven't closed that gap, we'll continue, we'll consider extending that arrangement into a second year, all right? So we've cleared that hurdle. Um, Cigna presented to Mike on the town side and Trent uh, Donahue on the board side with a letter that says, we will replicate the current benefits that are in place for all the bargaining units. So one of the things the unions are always concerned of, hey, I don't wanna lose any benefits in this transition. Well, we've got a letter on signal letterhead that says we will replicate benefits in those instances where we find that there might be a systems disjoint, we will offer an equal or better standard when it comes to uh, addressing any potential uh, claim disjoint. So we've cleared that hurdle. Um, on the pharmacy side, um, our members uh, in calendar year 2020, uh, generated a little bit less than 22,000 scripts. Of those 22,000 scripts, only 280 of them would represent drugs that are not on the Cigna formulary. So we have a formulary match that's a little bit less than 99%. All right. So we've cleared that hurdle. Um, the exhibit that we're going to go over now, I think, supports the financial side of the ledger. Um, so I think we're there. Um, we haven't received any feedback from the union saying we're against this. Um, you know, that could happen. But I think we're at a position where we're ready to move and present this to you folks for your feedback. And then coming out of this, then we would clearly present it to the town council and hopefully get their buy-in as well. Chris, is there, Chris, this is Greg, I, I can't see you, but uh, is there a time limit on which the union must act? Um, great question. You know, everything that we're marching towards is for a July 1 effective date. So you don't want to start, Greg, any implementation on June 1. 
So we're probably within the next two weeks of really having to get into the mix on right. a move forward. So um, there is no particular uh, timeline in which they've missed their window. Um, we had timelines on our end in terms of when we had to deliver the proposal to them. We've met those timelines. Now we're just waiting. They can always grieve it, Greg. Yeah. Um, but at this point, um, yeah, there's nothing that would uh, hang us up as long as yeah. we get the thing moving forward in the next, you know, two weeks. I would Excellent. argue. Yeah. Excellent. Could, uh, could I ask, um, just for the sake of argument, what is the um, Anthem exclusive as opposed to Anthem Blue Cross? So the way it, we have our arrangement today, Polly, um, Anthem handles the medical administration, Anthem handles the pharmacy administration. Um, we have a line of business called Stop Loss. Um, we have that place through uh, a captive mm -hmm. that's managed by CREC. Mm -hmm. The Anthem exclusive is based upon Anthem taking the stop loss over. Oh, so okay. they would exclusively handle the medical, the pharmacy and the stop loss. Okay. Um, so what's the, um, uh, cause and so what is the, um, the, what is the cost for us to be um, included in the, in the, uh, uh, in the captive is yep. that, so it makes sense to, um, well, the other, I'm, I'm assuming then if we go to Cigna, then um, we would what, participate in the captive or not? Yeah, we, we would stay in the captive. Okay. We would stay in the captive. And when you look at kind of where I'm per putting my cursor now, um, this kind of yeah. picks up everything that's going on from a stop loss standpoint. Okay. Um, our rates through the captive are expected to go up about seven and a half percent. Okay. Um, I've made the assumption, whether it's Cigna, Aetna, you know, Connecticut, that that captive relationship would stay in place. But in fairness to Blue Cross, because they did put forth a competitive rate from a stop loss standpoint, um, I did highlight their rate at the $77 to show the value of putting the stop loss there. Um, so we're trying to make sure we kind of properly lay everybody out. Um, my recommendation is to maintain the captive relationship. Um, I think this $77 rate is a, an attempt to just get us into the fold, knock the captive out of existence. And then Anthem has, I guess what I would call no real competition when it comes to what they can do for that rate. Um, the exhibit that I'm gonna bring you to now kind of shows our history with the captive. And when you go back to 2016, that year represented our first year in the captive, which represented a 5% reduction in cost over when Anthem handled the stop loss. With the exception of one year, um, our experience has been great when it comes to what we get from a rate increase out of the captive. The stop loss market generally increases at 20 to 25% a year. When you look at our experience in the captive, we've averaged less than 10% a year. So as much as that Anthem offer is compelling, um, my fear is once the captive's gone and the captive has been a good friend to, to Weathersfield, the minute that captive goes away, then Anthem has full reign to take that $77 up to 90, up to 110, up to 130. Um, that's why I'm recommending that we stay within the captive. Yeah, Chris, this is Paul Mead. Uh, we had a couple of really bad years uh, from, the, from the stop loss carrier's perspective where we were over, well over the, uh, the threshold and they, they didn't kill us on the rates. Is Correct. that fair to say? Yep. Um, yeah. When you look at this, you know, the 25% Paul was a gift. Yeah. That was the year in which, you know, 
they took it on the chin. Um, so as much as you don't like to see a 25% increase, um, we probably should have got 50. Or yeah. candidly, we probably should have got thrown out of the captive. Right. So as much as you look at this and say, whoa, what happened there? You got to look, and, and I appreciate you bringing it up. You got to look at it in terms of the context of where we were experience wise. Um, they've been nothing but a friend to us. But what we're trying to convey, and I, I, there's a lot of moving pieces here, right? We're trying to pick up every conceivable area that funds the administrative workings of this plan. We're picking up admin fees. We're picking up what Blue Cross calls their shared discount fees. We're picking up the stop loss integration fee that they charge to share data with the captive. We're pulling in our stop loss premium. We're pulling in the value of the RX rebates. We're tying it all together and we're coming up with an estimate of where we think the savings will fall amongst all these various carriers. What we're also doing, and this is the telling exhibit, is we are looking at it over the three-year term of our relationship with Cigna. And we're trying to, and let me blow this up a little bit. We're trying to model out, hey, what is our low end savings estimate, the moderate estimate and the high end. And depending upon the assumptions that you pull into this, you're looking at anywhere of a low end three year savings of about a half a million bucks up to about 900,000 on the high end. Um, we're gonna be more towards that moderate to high end when it comes to savings. And as we said to the unions, how many Chromebooks can you buy for a half a million bucks? How many positions can be maintained? How many roads can be paved? How many police vehicles can be bought? You know, that's how you got to look at it because this is real savings based upon all of the quantifiable areas in which we're spending money under the, uh, under the plan. So, so Chris, are you are you looking for us to um, make some sort of motion? Are you making a recommendation? Yeah, I, I want to get Mike to chime in here. Yeah, and you know, I admittedly, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, but uh, I by no means want to put anyone on the committee in an uncomfortable position like we're, you know, I, I feel like I did spring this a little bit. It just struck me. Um, you know, and I sent that message out this afternoon to uh, to give everyone a, a, a notice on this. Um, so, you know, we can, timing wise, it'd be great if you were comfortable to make a recommendation to the council uh, tonight. And if you're not, um, I think next me week, next month's meeting would work. And if for some reason that doesn't, we could always call a special meeting, just a quick you know, single purpose meeting to, uh, you know, to, to get everyone's input and answer final questions and things like that. So I, I, I defer completely to the committee on that, you know, whether what you want to do tonight. Right. Okay. okay. Well, uh, let's take a uh, first a straw poll. Is uh, anyone opposed to making a motion uh, to accept these? Is anybody opposed to making a motion on the, what we just saw? No. Okay. Uh, would no. someone like to make a motion to uh, accept the um, the uh, results that uh, Chris showed us showed to us? So moved. Okay. Second. A discussion. A discussion on it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. A discussion on it. A discussion. No, I think we're. Uh, I think we got a good explanation. I think we're we're um, going to rely on Mr. Moreau, which we have in the past, and and I think I'm I'm very comfortable with it. So. That's where I am. Okay. Paul, any thoughts? Well, Chris uh, Monroe, what, what exactly are you, uh, what exactly is the recommendation that you're making here? Yep, so my recommendation is that we move forward with a proposal that supports 
replacing uh, Cigna, uh, or let me step back. We move forward with a proposal where we end our relationship with Blue Cross as our medical administrator and begin a new relationship with Cigna effective July 1. On the pharmacy side, I'm also recommending that we end our pharmacy relationship with Blue Cross and begin a new relationship on July 1 with Express Scripts. Okay, okay. Then let, me, let me restate it then. Based on uh, Chris uh, Munro's um, uh, recommendation, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation? Yes. yes. Do I have a second of that? Second. All in favor, show your hands or say aye. 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 The motion carries uh, um, 100%. So the, the committee is unanimously in favor of uh, the motion that Chris put forward. Did they say that properly, according to Robert's rule of orders, Paul? You got that, Mike? <laughs> You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> oh, wait a second. I thought Mike, you were the one. Mike would know better than me. No, okay. I, yeah, you're fine. I just, okay. let me, is everyone agree or comfortable that the, you are making a recommendation based on Chris's yeah. analysis and recommendation? The committee recommends to the council the plan set forth by Chris in USI. Correct. Agree. Okay. Yes. Outstanding. Great. Right. Could I just um, comment that I um, I want to thank Chris for uh, for such a comprehensive um, uh, breakdown for us uh, for all of this information. This has been uh, really terrific, and Chris is worked with us for a number of years and uh, and I'm, you know, sometimes we joke about it, him giving us a lot of information, but um, this has been really helpful and especially the way it's all broken down. So thank yeah. you very much. Holly, thank Great. you very much. I, I think, you know, the, the last comment I would make is, you know, Mike and I and, and Trent on the board side said, listen, I want the union to be able to go through every single tab, every exhibit, yeah every single thing, because if, you know, they have to be comfortable with it. They have to know where the savings is coming from, right? And, you know, like I said, jokingly, it's the spreadsheet that kind of grew and grew and grew. And, you know, this is a perfect example, but again, the goal is, you know, it's all right here. You know, there's, there's everything that you need to go through the assumptions and how we crunch the numbers. And we looked at this thing six different ways this Sunday, and it all came back to, uh, it's time to move on. It's time to kind of go in a different direction. Can I ask one more question? Um, ultimately, um, just budget wise, uh, what kind of a savings for the actual town toward the town budget is this going to result in? It'll depend. I'm sorry. It'll depend on uh, whether the council approves this before they adopt the budget. Right. Um, but and so I'm not going to I'm not going to give you a hard number on that, Polly. But OK, we are we've budgeted a two and a half percent increase, which is okay. extremely low because of experience, not right. reflecting uh, mm -hmm. any savings from a move to a different program. So okay. um, to answer your question, it would be less than a two and a half percent increase, which would be, um, you know. It's, it's, yeah, two and a half percent is, um, is terrific <laughs> from what we've seen in the past. So, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah, and, okay, so and that two and a half. Town, and what I'll say right. to the town council is, especially on the pharmacy side, is there's so much more transparency under this model than there is under the other model, whether it's Anthem on the medical or Anthem on the pharmacy. You know, at least with Cigna, we know our admin is going to be based upon a per employee per month fee. Blue Cross does that, or Cigna's per employee per month. What Blue Cross does is they hide a lot of their charges in what they call the claim wire. So it's not so upfront where this is what we're charging you. They bury a lot of their expenses in the claims. We're now operating in a more transparent environment. And that same thing bridges over to the pharmacy. Um, 
here's the thing that you struggle with Anthem on. And again, I know I'm being long-winded. You know, when Anthem knew that they had one foot on a banana peel, they started saying, where are we going wrong? And our comment to them was, um, we can drive $780,000 in rebates under Express Scripts. Because guess what? We're now part of a consortium that's two and a half million members. And they bring a lot more weight to negotiations than we do at 1,500 people trying to bang it out with Anthem each and every year. We're getting 100% of the rebate, and that's going to roll up to 800 and or 780. Anthem comes back. Now, keep in mind, with Anthem, we're getting 400,000 in rebates. They come back and say, well, you're going to get 750 with us. And it's like, whoa, time out. You're telling us we're getting 100% of the rebate now, and it's 400. We're going to get 100% of the rebate next year, and it's now 750. What, what's going on? And they come back and say, well, you're right. We made a mistake. It's not 750, it's 640. And we're yeah. like, same question. <laughs> oh, that's better. Same question, you know? <laughs> but for you. So it's so <laughs> dubious because you know what they do, Frank? What they say is, yeah, we're getting 780 in rebates, but we're calling 300,000 of them marketing support dollars from drug manufacturers. We don't share marketing support dollars. We only share rebates. So it's you say potato, I say potato. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. With Express Scripts, it's like, hey, listen, the, we're making our money on the spread between what we give you as a discount on the drugs and what we're actually negotiating. Anthem's getting paid there too. When it comes to the rebates, it all flows back to us, i.e. the 700, uh, 780 versus Anthem's 400. One of the things I said in the notes and I said to the union is, it is dubious at best if you think you're getting 640. That's never going to happen. Never going to happen. They can put any number they want to try to try to be competitive, but it's just not going to materialize under them. It's not going to happen. So more transparency under this model as well. Outstanding. Really. Nice. Excellent work, Chris. Excellent work. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, folks. Okay. Chris Werger, can you chop that? You know, it's just it's just sad that that the next two and a half hours will be even more detailed. <laughs> so, no, in in really, I think, listen, Chris. I think you start out with a joke. You got to tell a joke, or something, just to get everybody warmed up. Well, you know me way too well, Mr. Curtin. <laughs> and, and what I would say is, just like last month was the you know the March with March Madness. We have our own version, which is the march towards July 1st in the property casualty field. And uh, yes, it's exciting. Yes, it's neurotic. Uh, the marketplace is a tough one, but there are a lot of good things happening. And, and a lot of it is built around, um, I'll say, the work that the town and the school district do to control losses the best they can. I would say that there's some stability with um, the overall program year to year that Ashley and her colleagues have built, uh, and that's helped out quite a bit. Um, but there's still a lot that has to happen, and there's a lot that has to happen behind the scenes to keep forward momentum. So what I'll do is I'm going to, we have a couple agenda items here, and I, I generally keep them fairly broad. At, at some point, when we're, when we're in person, if that's in the middle of your parking lot or in your conference room, I'm not sure which one will be first. Um, maybe we can get into some more detail, but we have two items, the budget and the renewal update, which really is that March towards July 1st. And then we have other risk management and insurance activities. And I'm going to mention one thing we're doing with Matt, and then um, I'd like to make sure that we have some time for Ashley um, to, to have some time if there's anything that she wants to also add that's happening at Kerma. So uh, first off, regarding the marketing, um, one thing... Uh, Kathy Crooker, my colleague, and I are working with Mike O'Neill on some flood coverage, uh, flood coverage assessments. Uh, believe it or not, you do have uh, one property, a public works building that's actually in a flood zone. So uh, we like to make sure that we do an annual review of the coverage that's needed. We look at the various deductibles and, and try to get an understanding of even, you know, is there a need for contents coverage, knowing that you can move some of that stuff you know, in, in, before we have waters rise. 
secondly, the overall property liability coverage. Uh, Kerma just recently released the schedules for the properties, the autos and the equipment. And what we like to do is make sure that we have uh, the right level of coverage. We look at claims case studies that have taken place over the past couple of years. And to give you an example, um, we have what's known as a salt shed. You guys are familiar with salt sheds. There's a lot of product like salt and you know, dirt and whatnot inside those. And historically, many municipalities have decided we don't want to insure dirt or we don't want to insure salt. But what has happened a couple of times with our clients is that there have been some weather events which have caused the, the, the roof uh, membrane and the structures to actually gets so damaged that water has intruded inside <laughs> and caused like the salt product to actually go bad. They, it really can't be used. And there's at a peak season, the cost to replace that type of product is a lot greater than it is off season. So that's just an example of looking at this more carefully. Um, the fire trucks, that's another one that a long time ago, we did a very, very comprehensive study on what the costs of new or like kind and quality fire trucks should be, whether it's a pumper, whether it's an aerial or a tower or some one of those. So again, um, we don't have formal findings right now, but what we do is we get very detailed. Again, we work alongside Kerma on those. Uh, Ashley's well aware of that. We've had multiple conversations on uh, many shared clients and members um, on this topic too. So that's another one that we're looking at. As we make our way through April and into May, towards the end of April, that's when, again, we'll take a look mutually with Ashley on just the, the losses by the end of April. And as we get into May and no later than the beginning of June, that's where we begin to kind of look at fine tuning. What will the rates that have already been shared, you know, what are the final rates looking like? Uh, secondly, what is the possibility that Kerma will have a member equity distribution program? I say possibility because it's premature right now to say yes, no, or what it actually is. Um, and, and I'm sure Ashley has a little bit more to add there. But again, uh, those are some pieces there. Uh, we also review ancillary coverages, okay? Each year, there may be some insurance products out there that are either a good investment or not a good investment to go after to actually transfer financial risk. One example, and it, it's, I'll say it's somewhat relevant to your situation or it's totally relevant to your situation is something that's known as either workplace violence coverage, active assailant coverage. Um, some people call it active shooter coverage. I don't really like that title, um, but property insurance is generally built to cover repair replacement of damaged structures as well as extra expenses and maybe loss of income related to that. But when you have a workplace violence situation, there may not be actual damage to a structure, but there may be great extra expenses that are incurred because temporarily you have to relocate municipal operations somewhere else because there may have been emotional or mental trauma at a, at a, at a certain location. Uh, so what we're doing is, and, and you know, Ashley and I have talked, we've talked with other colleagues inside USI and Kerma. Um, there are you know, some, some insurance costs to have these specialty products. We think that currently um, these are just viewed as more educational in nature. Um, it might be something that we take a look at next year. But again, the idea here is to look at current, actual and emerging types of risks and look at the new type of insurance programs that may or may not be a good fit and just make an educated decision whether it's time to table that, maybe look at it further um, and go from there. Uh, and to give you an example, it was probably seven or eight years ago, we were having this conversation about cyber insurance coverage where a lot of people were saying, yeah, you know, not much of an exposure, kind of expensive. Yeah, let's, let's talk about it next year. Right. Well, that's the type of thing that happens here. Um, you know, we really keep our fingers crossed that we don't have a workplace violence situation. And a lot of it gets into the culture of the community. It gets into knowing your employees. 
taking care of them and that type of thing and, and honestly doing the best you can. So that's that part of it. Um, so a big piece, a big, you know, one of the big activities right now um, and uh, is really it's the continual assessment and marketing of that standalone cyber insurance coverage to be effective July 1st, 2021. Okay. Mike and I uh, and, our, and our colleagues, we spent a lot of time looking at the types of questions that are literally on the applications um, to make sure that one, we're accurate, we're portraying the accurate picture of the controls and the systems that are in place, but two, making sure that we highlight what are the positives inside the town and the school district, okay? So USI has access to at least a couple different programs uh, and uh, we're, we're not there yet. It's gonna take a little bit more time. It is a very, very volatile and changing marketplace, literally week to week. So that's something going on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause right now for two reasons. One, does anybody have any questions on what I've shared so far? And secondly, Ashley, is there anything you'd like to add? Because I know you're you are knee deep, if not further, with the whole world of cyber. Um, I'm actually going to back up to your active assailant and bring it a little bit close to home. I don't know who saw the news two days ago, but there was an active shooter event about a mile and a half from my home in Branford. And it's really amazing that, you know, someplace you drive by every day to go to the dry cleaner, to the florist, to the deli, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You don't know what's going to happen. So I agree with Chris as far as emerging risks go. Um, you know, like cyber, once upon a time, cyber was a, a nice to have and now is a necessity. Unfortunately, I feel like active assailant is going to be moving that way also. Um, moving on to cyber, unless anyone has any questions on active assailant. All right, moving right on to cyber. It is an extremely volatile market right now. Um, I was able to work with one of my partner carriers to secure a non-binding indication. Like Chris said, it's a matter of getting applications. So what we have again is just an indication based on sort of a triage scan that this carrier does of the town and, and BOE's public facing website. So moving along with ransomware, um, you know, a lot of carriers are still offering coverage. Ransomware is a big area of concern. MFA, which is multi-factor authentic authentication. Um, RDP, which is remote desktop protocol, those are basically sort of like the, 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 the things that you need in order to be eligible for a quote. Um, whether or not you do business with solar winds is another big question that the markets are asking. Um, obviously, with the recent Microsoft Exchange incident, there's there's a lot of moving pieces. So, you know, again, it's it's pretty easy to get non-binding indications, but in order to get something, you know, to move forward with filling out the applications and really getting the questions answered is important. Yeah, thank you. That was. Yeah, it's like walking, walking along the same pathway in a lot of ways. Um, any questions so far on anything we've covered that doesn't have to do with Chris Monroe and all of that benefits information? <laughs> Just kidding. I had to weave him in again. You know, um, I miss him. You know, I haven't seen him that often. But um, all right. So we'll pivot over to uh, 2B on the, on the uh, agenda, which is the other risk management and insurance activities. And We'll keep it short. I, I will say that one of the aspects of our public entity practice at USI is that it can literally be any one of the seven days of the week, it could be on a weekend, that something might happen where there's a need to consult. It can be a tragic situation. It could be a contractual matter. Uh, we don't know. So it's funny whenever I read other risk management and insurance activities, and I just say to myself, it could be tomorrow uh, when there might be something happen where we need to be on the phone immediately. And that's one of the aspects of, you know, working with public entities. It's kind of like being a public servant. So what I will say is that, like I, I mentioned before, with Matt Kazaka, there's this sleepy little insurance policy called an interscholastic sports and student accident policy. 
It's one that renews usually in August of each year. It's not something that you often talk about, but uh, what's interesting about this one is that, you know, we really, to help the town and the school district manage their financial situation, you really have to, you know, look at the details. You have to look under every rock. And this, this is a coverage that school districts have to help the parents and guardians with out-of-pocket medical expenses. So you think about football, soccer, some of the contact sports, um, but it also provides for well, almost like excess medical coverage for student accidents, whether it be during school time or 24 hour coverage. Uh, what's interesting is over the past year, as you know, we haven't really had much in the way of contact sports. You know, a lot of it has been suspended, but as the, you know, I guess our society opens up with more vaccinations and we expect to see more activities in a way of contact sports and whatnot. We definitely want to help Matt um, with reviewing the costs of that coverage. Uh, we've done that for some other clients. Uh, we've benchmarked what we think it should be based on the number of participants, the size of the school district, uh, and looking at the multi-year loss history. Um, so it's something new. We haven't, you know, it, it, it technically falls a little bit outside our contract, but we have enough intelligence in this area that we've helped a couple other school districts last year to reduce their costs by 10 to 15 percent. Um, so again, every little bit helps there. So we are going to try to do that. And um, so that's going to be something as we go into the month of May and June. So it's going to be somewhere between 60 and 90 days before that next renewal. We'll be helping Matt with that one. So um, more to follow there. Uh, those costs generally are anywhere from four digits into the five digits of premium. I've seen as low as $5,000 and I've seen as high as $25,000. So there's a really, really big spread. And we wanna make sure that Matt gets the best of the best you know, for the school district as we get closer to August. So again, something new there. Uh, um, so, excuse uh, me, uh, Chris, yeah. I have a question. Uh, sure. Do the uh, parents of the um, uh, the people who um, participate in sports uh, contribute to that? I I can't remember. Do they contribute premium or? That's a great question. I I don't know the specific answer as far as it relates to Weathersfield Public Schools and the sports, but I will say that in general, what I've seen is that parents don't specifically contribute to reimburse for the insurance premium costs of the interscholastic sports. Um, they may obviously have one of those pay to play type programs where there's a cost for certain types of sports. But I will say that the student accident portion of that policy is more, generally it's more of a voluntary program where they elect at the beginning of the school year to pay, you know, it's usually it's like $16 or $30 to have that type of coverage. And again, it's it's essentially excess medical coverage. It can be dental coverage. Um, the take up rate poly is not that great. It's usually one to 3% of the population. Um, so, so that's how that part works. Okay. I hope that helps a little bit there. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Uh, so, so that's uh, most of my report there, but I did want to give some time for Ashley. I know you had an emergency there last meeting, but just in terms of Kerma, I would say that, you know, as I'm thinking about the committee members here, is there anything as you're kind of going month to month uh, that you wanted to report on how Kerma is doing or anything in specific? In specifics? Sure, we are, you know, still doing really well. First quarter wrapped up. Our numbers are where we're hoping they're gonna be. As Chris said, it's way too early to, you know, speak on the member equity distribution, but like in years past, we still have really sound and strong financials. We wrapped up our liability reinsurance on the primary and the lead 10 million. We just finished renewing our pollution ancillary policy. We are in the process of wrapping up our property reinsurance. So we're actually moving things along in a really good place. Our new broker is, is doing a great job and, and we're ahead of the game right now. Site is the main problem as it always is. 
Understood. So thank you. That's uh, it's it's nice to hear good news or stability, especially these days. <clears throat> um, Chairman uh, Frank or anybody else, any questions you can think of? Obviously, we have plenty of other categories that we could probably talk about, but uh, I, I've like got one, Chris. Chris, I've, I've got one. Um, I've been reading about the, I, I guess you, you sort of uh, alluded to it with the uh, volatility of the cyber market, but from what I've been reading, uh, quite a few carriers are taking a beating. Now, is that something that you're, you're, I'm sure you're hearing about that. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, so it's it's interesting, Greg, because what we're hearing in the news, um, I always start broadly and say the entire marketplace is made up of private sector or privately owned businesses. You have public businesses, literally with shareholders, and then you have the public entity arena, which includes towns, schools, cities, utility utilities, transit districts and everything like that. And, you know, totally agree. I think what we're finding is that the criminals are very sophisticated. They stay one step ahead. The insurance industry that provides cyber insurance coverage, this has been a, an insurance product where it has not, the product itself in the premiums charged in the coverages and the retentions have not reached what I'd call an equilibrium based on the types of losses. The losses are continuing to go up. So we're still, I, I hate to say it, but my, this is my own opinion, is that we are still in almost like the end of the first, the first third of this life cycle where a lot of insurance carriers are still aggregating a ton of data to try to figure out where they're gonna be but it may very well be that we end up with, you know, a world of sublimits on cyber extortion and ransomware coverage, higher retentions, some absolute strict mandates that in order to have coverage, you have to be doing A, B, and C, um, like Ashley alluded to. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where if you want to try to place coverage, you better do it sooner rather than later. Um, but but like anything, the best terms and conditions you'll get will be built on sound risk management practices, specifically in this area. So Ashley, I yeah, hope- no, I Greg, to, to, to add on to what Chris said, as far as carriers and seeing losses, up until recently, cyber underwriters, and I used to be one at a very large organization in New York City, really went off of applications. And now the technology has advanced and again, like Corvus carriers are using these, these public facing scans to actually underwrite the information. So like any liability line of business, in 2016, it seems like a great risk. Everyone's putting it on the books. Fast forward five years, now all the losses are rolling in. Yeah, and the price- It's all is timing, it's all timing. Exactly, exactly. And that's a lot of the reason why we're doing away with the Karma Pool program. For that very reason, we had a great program five years ago, $10,000 retention, very, very low premium, full prior acts. And, you know, again, fast forward, the retention is now $100,000. The premium <laughs> has quadrupled and, there you go. and it's just not sustainable anymore. Right. So, I was reading an article too in business insurance, I don't know, it must've been the past couple of weeks. Um, a lot of carriers who in that situation wrote pieces of business new last year are already sending out non-renewal notices, especially in public sector. So it's, well, you it's know gonna what? be it's tough. Just, it's the maturation of the book. Exactly. Because everybody and their brother were trying to jump on that premium. Yep. And exactly. now, uh, now it always comes home to roost when you have a new product. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. one, of the thing, one of the things I would say, Greg, just kind of like a final comment is that there is still a lot of variability in the carriers. There's a lot of inconsistency on terms, conditions, pricing. Uh, like, like I'll tell you, USI has a smaller municipal client in Connecticut, okay? 
And if I were to tell you that the carrier that renewed the program in March of 2021 renewed it for no increase in premium, no increase in deductible, and it's a carrier that six months ago said they're not taking any new business. But that's an example of there's still some inconsistency. I call it opportunity. But again, uh, there is I no- I call it bad underwriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say that, Ashley. That, that's what that sounds like. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but again, it, it, it really does come down to the fundamentals of risk management because okay. nobody should be relying upon insurance coverage as the backstop end-all solution to risk management. Nobody wants that ransomware situation or employees getting tricked if they can help it. That is a bad day, right? That ends up being a bad week and a bad month and a financial disaster. Agreed. Well, thank you guys for that. Appreciate it. No, you're welcome. Any other questions or comments? I, I just, um, I wanted to follow back and this isn't related to, um, uh, the information that you gave us on the um, on these coverages, um, you did not mention workers' comp. Where are we going with the renewal on that? Ashley, do you want to start? I, I could. There's two parts to that. One of them probably is the question we get from clients, which is, "Hey, Chris, is anything happening with the workers' comp statutes so far related to COVID?" Okay. And, and, I, and the short answer with that one is that there has not been a change in Connecticut with, with the workers' compensation statute in terms of the presumption of that type of thing as we sit here today for municipalities. There were some executive orders uh, that, that had a window of time when primarily healthcare workers could make claims uh, under the workers' comp system. But right now we're still, we're still sitting here. Yeah. Okay. Bad, bad. Oh. Whoa. What happened? Sorry. Oh. I didn't realize that I shut my camera and not mute. My new puppy is eating. Ah. Bread, so. There you go. <laughs> I thought you were yelling at Chris Wardrobe. No. <laughs> I know. I was I'm thinking so about embarrassed that. right now. I'm so sorry. Man. No, not at all. Not at all. Call. Where? Should I show you what the I puppy call now? I mean. Maybe We're in a well. judge-free zone here, right? <laughs> yeah, property but, um, casualty covered for that. Puppy there covered. it is. A little puppy. Oh, my God. <laughs> a big puppy. That's a puppy? Yeah. It's 10 oh, months. Oh, my God. What is he? You know that, What's his name? His okay. name is Bernard. He's a rescue. I got him just before Christmas. And aside from him liking to eat fabric, he's great. <laughs> Risk management starts in the home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or so, fails in the home. Yeah, right. did, you, so, did you report that to your insurance company for liability uh, purposes? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's never a Rottweiler. It's a mix. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but seriously, go, going back to Polly's question. So there were two parts. The first part is kind of like, where does the statute today? But the second part gets into, you know, where are we in terms of rates and that Type of thing, Polly. Did is it either one of those or a third part? I just want to make no, sure. No, no, we... it was it was just generally um, in as far as the rates were concerned. Were there uh, how were they looking for uh, the next year? Or haven't they? Uh... Yeah, they're they're definitely stable. And Ashley, I am off the top of my head. I think it's either one or the other. But go ahead. I think well, you know better. I was going to say, Mike, do you care if I say so? The workers' compensation, Polly, were actually in with a flat renewal this year for Weathersfield. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Well, that's we, good to hear. Yeah. So we have 0% on that. And as you guys know, the audit is now premium neutral. So there's going to be no fluctuation on that end, which Mike, I'm sure you love, finally. I do. <laughs> um, and then on the lap, we have um, plus 3%, which is part of the rate agreement. Okay. Is that a three-year rate? That I think we are in the middle or the middle. last year of the rate agreement. Middle, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and that's um. Yeah, thank you for confirming that, Ashley. Uh, yeah, and that 
that 3% poly is, it's a, it's like a rate cap. Okay. Um, right. And so it protects against upward pressure. And in this marketplace, uh, when you look back on the time when a bunch of us evaluated going into a multi-year agreement on that lap package policy, when you look back, that was a very, very smart move given the environment that we're all in today. Okay. Okay. Great. There's a lot of reasons I won't in this, you know, on this call, uh, I won't get into all the specifics, but just encapsulate it that it was a smart business decision, uh, everything being considered. Thank you. And he, unbiased, I agree with Chris. I think you guys really put yourselves in a great position. All righty. Any more questions for Chris or Chris or Ashley? No. Okay. Is there any other business to discuss? Anybody? Anybody? I will say on a personal note that uh, when I retired from the Army, I was eligible for uh, uh, Fricare for Life, and their prescription benefits are through Express Scripts. And I will tell you that in 14 years, their customer service is off the charts. They are amazing. They will, they will follow up with you. Uh, if your prescription is behind, they'll, they'll uh, send it out as an emergency piece. But outstanding customer service. I was actually concerned when uh, Cigna took them over, and I thought, eh, you know? <laughs> yeah. But if anything, it's gotten better. The website is updated. So nothing but uh, praise for the customer service. That's good to know. I should bring you to the next town hall meetings with the unions. Uh, you know what? As a retired <laughs> officer, I guess I could have some credibility in 14 years of experience. Yeah, no, so, absolutely. And you know, I, I, I set the per bar pretty hard for my, pretty high for myself and others, and uh, they are five star in terms good. of customer service. So, good to know. Absolutely. Good job there. Okay, we are now at the next part, which is our next meeting is on May 20th. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. May I have a motion? Okay, Tom. Okay, second. I second. All in favor say aye by raising your hand. Aye. aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank great, you very much. Have a good night. Have a great Thank presentation, you. Guys. Sorry, you heard Thank me everybody. yelling at my dog. <laughs> okay. It was simply Bye. awful, awful. Thank you. All right, everyone. It was so good to see everyone. Uh, you too, Ashley.